Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm Brian Barrett. I'm the news editor of Wired. Uh, and uh, with us today is Mark Warner, senator uh, from Virginia, former governor of Virginia, spent uh, two decades in the telecommunications industry, uh, and vice chair of the Senate uh, Intel Committee. Um, and so uniquely qualified to talk about the issues that we're facing today uh, and discussing today about uh, Russia's attempts to influence democracy uh, and successful attempts uh, at that. Um, so Senator Warner, I guess just to start, I think we're just going to go right in. You are in a position to know more about this than literally anyone in this room uh, or, or building or <laughs> really this country uh, to a certain point. So do you mind just starting by talking through some of the key points that you think were the uh, most serious actions against the US for people who haven't followed it maybe right. beat by beat? Well, thank you, Brian. And um, thank you all for, for coming out. I know Saturday afternoon at 5 o'clock is not the easiest time to wrap your head around um, Russian intervention, but it is an extraordinarily important and extraordinarily timely topic. Uh, let me very briefly, because I think we're going to be able to come back and touch on a lot of these subjects, give you what we know. This, this effort, um, our, the Senate Intelligence Committee investigation started in January of 2017, so we're roughly 14 months in. And it really started after the intelligence community assessment came out in January, I think January 7th of 2017. Here's what we know for sure. And I'm not going to, you know, if, if I told you about the subject you probably want to all hear about, whether there was collaboration or collusion, that's a question that we still have to go into. But the things we know without question, and I think, and I say this, and this is terribly important, on a bipartisan basis are at least three things. One, that Russia massively intervened in our elections. Now, we should have been ready for this because Russia was, had a history of intervening in elections throughout Europe, particularly in the Baltics and Eastern Europe, well before 2016. What they did in 2016, and some of these activities were planned long before the campaign started, was first of all, they hacked into both political parties and got a particular bonanza on the Democratic side in terms of information. And at the highest levels determined that rather than in the normal course of espionage where you take information and pretty much retain it, they decided that they would share the information that would be harmful to one candidate, Clinton, and helpful to the other candidate, Mr. Trump. Now, that weaponization of information was in a way that we'd never seen in this country before. But if you and, and I've become a bit of the student of the Russian doctrine, if you go back to even 2011, um, one of the Russian military leaders, Mr. Garamazov, General Garamazov, recognized that Russia could not compete you know, tank for tank, rocket for rocket, ship for ship, for that matter, with America or the West, but they could use misinformation and disinformation in an asymmetrical way to really kind of destabilize Western democracies, because at its core, part of what Russia's goal was, beyond helping Mr. Trump at a, at a greater level, was the goal of trying to destabilize Western democracy and pit Americans against Americans. So the first was this use of information. The second thing that we know was that Russia and its agents basically tried to intervene or at least rattle the door of 21 states' electoral systems. Now, they didn't change actual vote totals. Um, matter of fact, there is some speculation that their kind of um, intervention was so digitally noisy that they almost expected to be caught and that to a degree they were operating on the ori original premise that Mr. Trump would lose and Again, if we think back to that campaign, at least in my lifetime, I could never remember a political candidate of either party before the election saying he or she might not accept the results of that election. So consequently, when you know, there was some theory at least that, that the Russians touched these systems, leaving digital dust, so that in the event that Mr. Trump lost, he would have had a, a cause to um, But we'll come back to that because there's great vulnerabilities that were made. And the third, and this is the area that probably has some of the most far-reaching effects, is, and I say this as a guy, my friend Susan Ness here, you know, 
I've been in the technology field longer than I've been in politics. I was in, in the telecom world and then a venture capitalist um, and have been hugely pro-tech and a big believer in you know, these great iconic American tech companies like Facebook and Twitter and Google. What they were able to do, though, were take these co companies and others, increasingly find Reddit, uh, Tumblr, others, and take the, in effect, the social media universe that has kind of transformed all our lives and basically use that social media universe in ways that had never been used before. We, in effect, saw the dark underbelly of social media. So, you know, they used paid advertising, they used the creation of fake accounts, and the fake accounts that literally claimed tens of millions and ultimately over 100 million just on Facebook of folks who saw the information where they would seed an account, not bring politics in until after it collected a number of followers and then slowly start to sift in politics. And they also then would use bots and other things to try to advance these causes. So uh, in, sh in short, weaponization of information, intervening in 21 states' electoral systems, and a use of social media that has been unprecedented, but since that election time has been continued to be used in other countries around Europe and even based on recent reports, uh, even in the Mexican elections that are going on at this point. So that's kind of what we know, and I know that the, 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 uh, the other question that maybe would have brought a few more people here if we were going to focus on that, uh, you know, that next, the last stage of was there coordination or collaboration is something that the committee and obviously Special Prosecutor Miller are still pursuing. Well, I, I want to go ahead and take the last part first because it's been in the news so much lately, the idea of uh, the Russian trolls through the Internet Research Agency, this uh, an 80-person campaign that infiltrated Facebook and other uh, uh, social media platforms. I, I, I want to talk through a timeline a little bit, though, because Robert Mueller had their indictment against the IRA, and he said, all right, so the activity starts in the spring of 2016. Uh, Facebook in following the election, um, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Facebook CEO, says it's crazy, the idea that any fake news would have infl uh, influenced the election. Um, it's not until six months after the election, I think, that Facebook even realizes there was a problem, and then another several months until they are upfront about the issues that they faced. And I guess, what took so long to your mind, now that you've worked with these, well, because you've worked with them closely now, and I think a lot of the information that's come has become under the pressure of your committee, do you feel that there was just a genuine sense of being caught flat-footed, or is there a certain amount of spin going on here and deflection? Well, I, I think it's, it's a very fair question. It's a really important question. Um, and let me, let me take it in a couple of ways. One, whether it was the social media platform com companies, or for that matter, the U.S. government, there should have been some acknowledgement, because some of these tactics, particularly in the Baltics, had been used had been used before. And again, some of this, you know, the difference with social media based upon traditional Russian misinformation, disinformation tactics, you know, this, Russia's had a long history. If you think back you know, after the assassination of Dr. King, uh, there were a number of Russian efforts to try to say the U.S. government was behind that. When the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, there were Russian efforts that would try to promote the notion that that was a creation of the American military. But in the old school, the kind of 20th century misinformation, disinformation, you had to plant a rumor or put a newspaper out or start a story. And in this 21st century world, and then hope it would, it would spread, in the 21st century world, with planting this information combined with automated bots and a little bit of paid advertising, you can drive any story to your top five stories on your newsfeed. And... Uh, I, I believe that uh, originally the, the social media companies were, uh, and the platform companies were reluctant to acknowledge that there was a problem. Uh, I will grant them that maybe they didn't fully appreciate it. Uh, I would say as well that, you know, honestly, the U.S. government, the intel community, should have been more aware as well. I think there is part of that lack of awareness or lack of understanding comes from the everything kind of in the cyber or misinformation, disinformation space and anything that comes with touching Americans' personal information gets very, very complicated and we have still 
you know, responsibilities that lie with the FBI in terms of counterintelligence, DHS, NSA, Cybercom, a little bit indirectly CIA. So, you know, a, a post that says they're Brian that appears on a phone in Austin that is actually named Boris out of St. Petersburg, the American government didn't know where that fell along, uh, along a line. Um, but one of the things, your, your comment, and I was out at Facebook in the spring of 16, or spring of 17 trying to make this case, they clearly, by that time, should have known because the same tools that were used in the American elections, and hopefully come back at what a great bang for the dollar or bang for the ruble uh, that the Russians were able to ob obtain using these techniques, by the time of the French elections, by the time in the spring, I believe April, of the French elections, and the French have a different set of rules, and the French media and political spectrum from left to right were much more aware of the threat, Facebook literally took down more than 30,000 plus sites in conjunction with the French. To this point, still, 14 months after we started our investigation, Facebook has only identified 470 accounts in the United States. Now, I gotta tell you, I, I don't know for sure the Russian efforts in France versus the United States, but I gotta believe, at the end of the day, they were probably similar in size and scope, so I really question whether we, not only with Facebook, but with Twitter and, and uh, particularly with YouTube's portion of Google, and increasingly with, uh, with Tumblr and Reddit, whether we have found all there is to find. Um, most all the activities been discovered so far have come from the one troll farm in St. Petersburg, uh, but uh, I think there still remains an open question whether there was more activity. Is it partly so hard to find uh, and hard to combat also because, yes, there was the ads piece, and it's pretty easy to say, well, uh, these are political ads being paid for in rubles, maybe that shouldn't happen, even though it did. Um, but the far larger piece are these organic accounts, right? That people just, they, they created some accounts, they may have promoted certain posts on that account, but as you said, posted some engaging content that worked the algorithm to gain big follower accounts, sometimes in the hundreds of thousands, I think. Um, but those accounts were using Facebook as it was intended. They were not doing anything, you know, you know in the grand scheme, they were being underhanded, but I could go on Facebook tomorrow, I won't but I could start a similar campaign with not much money and, and just sort of a, a savvy sense of how the platform works. Does that make it harder to identify them? And also, does that give us any hope of combating them in the future? Well, I do think the response of most of the platform companies, while slow, the one area that they have been kind of more willing to engage is around paid political advertising. And at first we thought this, you know, might have been kind of the mother load. It was not. It was the tiniest part of their campaign. And it was used to simply promote content that was already on some of the fake accounts. Uh, and the notion that, um, that, you, that some of the solution to this, and we've got bipartisan legislation that would at least take care of this, and Senator McCain and I and Senator Klobuchar, it's called the Honest Ads Act, that would at least say, if a foreign entity, which by the way is already illegal, is placing a, a political ad that names a candidate or is normal political content as if it would be on a television or radio ad, the rules that apply to television and radio ads in terms of sourcing ought to apply as well on the internet. Um, that seems to me to be kind of low-hanging fruit, but solving that in terms of paid political ads alone will not solve the problem. And particularly if you simply define it as paid political ads that mention a particular candidate's name or not. The much, as you mentioned, Brian, the much bigger issue is the question of creating the fake accounts. And, and the, let's again stay with Facebook for a moment, um, 120 plus of these accounts literally created followers that, of about 3.3 million, they generated tens and tens of thousands of additional posts, and that network ended up touching 126 million Americans during the campaign process. That was, a, again, a lot better return than the much smaller investment um, made uh, on, on paid advertising. And let me be clear, none of this stopped with the election day. If you look at, at, at activities since 
um, election. If you look, for example, about the debates uh, around NFL players kneeling during the national anthem, you have lots of, of Russian-based accounts stirring up on both sides of, of that issue. If you look as recently as the, you know, the tragic shooting in Las Vegas, or even more recently, the tragic shooting in Florida, you, know, you see the appearance, and we have, while all of these stories have not been traced back to Russia or other players, of fake news trending very highly on Google news searches in the aftermath of those tragedies. So this is an ongoing uh, exploitation effort. And uh, as I mentioned, it's, just to put it again in some context, um, since we've seen this activity not only taking place in America, we recently had members of the British Parliament in, and they're going back and investigating activities that took place in the Brexit vote. In the Dutch elections that were earlier in 17, the Dutch hand counted their ballots because they were so afraid of potential outside intervention. And I've already talked for a moment about the, uh, the French elections. If you add up the costs to the Russians of intervening in the American election, the Dutch election, the British election, and the French election, and add it all together, you're talking about less than the cost of one new F-35 airplane. And what I sometimes worry and wonder about is, you know, the United States, and I come from one of the most pro-defense states in, in the country, and I believe we need an enormously strong national defense. If you look at what America is now spending on national defense, we're roughly $700 billion. The Russians are spending $68 billion. Yet, in this area, and we're talking about misinformation, disinformation, I hope we get into cyber as well, that they've got us back on our heels. And I think we need a, a fulsome debate about whether we are buying the best 20th century military in terms of tanks, guns, ships, and planes that money can buy when much of the conflict in the 21st century, if you go back again to what is part of the Russian doctrine of conflict in the 21st century, this guy, General Garamazov, is going to be more fought with misinformation, disinformation, and then the tool that's even more powerful, cyber and its ability to disarm, disconnect, break down networks. And you know, are, we, are we fighting a 20th century war? Are we preparing for a 20th, 20th century conflict when a lot of the conflict in the 21st century may be in this new field? Yeah, I, I do want to get to the sort of direct cyber attacks because that is a piece I think that's been lost a little bit because it's not as fresh as the, the uh, propaganda activity. But I do want to go back to the Honest Ads Act quickly, introduced in October, as you said. Um, since then, Facebook has made some efforts towards self-regulating. They said, look, we are going to go ahead and preemptively do some of the things that you are asking uh, other platforms also. This is an industry that is very regulation shy. I mean, you, you were in telecom for 20 years. You know that the tech industry is not particularly open to government um, uh, intervention and regulation. So if we acknowledge, as we did, that the ads were the smallest piece of this, um, but we are, do you feel that companies have done enough to forestall that Honest Ads Act yet? And if not, does there need to be even further regulation in your mind to address the much bigger problem, right? Because it's, a, it's again, that's a very small piece. I think we will not solve this problem as much as I like the Honest Ads Act by simply passing the Honest Ads Act. It is a small component of the problem, but it frankly misses the overall power. And this has been something I think we've all been learning. And again, I'll grant the platform companies the fact that they are learning as well just as the intelligence community and um, elected officials are, are learning as well. But, you know, how do you sort through the notion of identity on the Internet? How do you sort through the notion of source of content? How do you recognize the fact that, you know, on, on Twitter, there was a Twitter account um, you know, that said it was the Tennessee Republican Party, 10 GOP, it had 130,000 plus Twitter followers. The actual Tennessee Republican Party Twitter account had 13,000. And the Russian-based account ended up getting retweeted, quoted in news stories all the time, and was just putting out outrageous statements. And I felt bad for the, you know, my Republican friends in Tennessee who were trying to say, hey, that's not us. But it took literally months for them to take down that site. How do you how do you grapple with it? How where how do you grapple with the fact that you know some estimates that there may be 15% of the um, 
accounts on, on Twitter are bots. If you accept the commonly accepted numbers of 320 million subscribers, that's a 45 million potential bot universe. Reddit, uh, which is just recently we're continuing to see uh, much more use there than where we initially focused on the, on the main platforms, um, you know, that prides itself on kind of being you know, anonymous in certain ways. I think we're going to have to have the kind of debate about what level of responsibility do the, the platform companies have for content that passes over them. Now, I know that is, uh, you know, that gets people's you know, hair up their neck uh, on end. But, um, you know, some of this discussion around you know, the platform companies for a long time around child pornography said they couldn't deal with, then they did. Around terrorist ideology and promotion of, of, of you know, bomb making said you can't deal with content, but then they did. I do think, you know, in, in, what's in the law, it's called Section 200, 230, I think we are going to have some level of discussion because what is happening here, the tools that have been used, go back to my analogy of how little it cost to kind of disrupt our election. These exact same tools, and what we've heard is there, there are starting to be firms set up in the Valley and elsewhere that are saying, we can use those same tactics to destroy a company's brand. We can go out and use those same tactics to promote or discount a stock. I think we can go out and use the, some of those same tactics and tools to, and particularly when you add in click farms and bots, drive up a digital advertising campaign and have fake numbers. So again, we've seen the benefits of social media. I think it's touched all our lives. But we're also seeing, as in anything, you're seeing you know, the good side, you're also now starting to see the, the challenging side. And I do think we, we're going to need, I, we had an earlier session on, on cyber where a number of the platform company representatives were there. We're going to need their, their cooperation because if not, and you simply leave this to Washington, we'll probably mess it up. So it needs to be a, more of a collaborative process. But the notion that, that this is going to go away just isn't accurate. And uh, the sooner we kind of grapple with it, because my fear is, Otherwise, you may have wide swaths of Americans that will lose faith. And part of the solution, as we talked about earlier, Brian, is, is we do need to educate all of us how to be better consumers of news and information over the Internet. But we've got elections in 2018 coming up. We've got a lot to do in the short term that simply re-educating Americans on how they consume news cannot be the only solution. Well, I do, and uh, I do want to get to those elections in 2018, which have already, as Texans know, they had the primary had uh, this past week, so they are already in the thick of it. Um, and, and what I, I want to start first with this question of preparedness. Uh, Facebook was not prepared for the Russian uh, onslaught, but neither was the DNC. Neither was the national. Neither were the national security agencies. I think it's probably fair to say. Um, and just as Facebook and others have been sort of slow to come around, is it fair to say that? the government has been slow to come around. The DNC only just hired a chief security officer in January. Uh, you know, the uh, Global Engagement Center, which is charged with fighting off Russian propaganda, has a $120 million budget that it has just refused to spend. Um, it has no Russian speakers. Uh, so does the government need to also look well, at itself? This has been, the short answer is yes. And it, it, I would, I believe it comes down to a couple reasons. One. It does come down to these distinctions of whose lane does this fall into? We're going to stay on misinformation, disinformation, creation of fake accounts, separate from cyber, although the, the two completely feed into each other. You know, it, it is not clear whose responsibility entirely it is to police this activity. And there has been, you know, particularly post-Snowden, a real reluctance from the tech community writ large to kind of want to be seen even engaging with uh, portions of the, the intelligence community. So there's not, there's not been a collaboration, and um, again, the government has been, has been slow to respond. Um, but what we're trying to do on this is, is because what's also, I'm sorry, lost, let me come back. The second item that's made the government slow to respond, and I will give you know, credit all of Mr. Trump's appointees in law enforcement and in the intelligence community recognize this threat. But the fact that the President of the United States still 
calls this occasionally a witch hunt or say there's no there there means that wide swaths of Americans don't realize how imminent and powerful this threat is. And you know, there's nothing about the Russians or any other foreign actor that could use these, this same toolkit that favors one party over the other. You know, they help one candidate one time, the next time they could help whoever is going to be in Putin's interest, or for that matter, Russian, or any other entity's interest. So uh, that is a real problem. You mentioned a couple of things. The De Department of Defense, the Congress said, hey, we got to be ready for this. They moved $120 million over from the DOD to the State Department, and zero of those dollars have been spent. In the aftermath of the, um, the incursions of the 21 states, it took us nine months to get DHS to tell the 21 states that were attacked which ones were attacked. It's almost a Kafka-esque kind of answer because they said, well, you know, the head election official may or may not have had appropriate clearances. Well, how can you prepare going forward? I can tell you in my state, we had elections, we're an off-year state in terms of our state elections. We had an election last year. I made sure that we had paper trails, and we'll get into this in a few minutes, on all our voting machines. And if that required changing out machines, we changed out machines. As recently as the last two weeks, where we had an, an open hearing, all of the intelligence community, from the FBI director to the director of national intelligence, all acknowledging this problem, but all saying they had not been directed by the president to make election security from Russia a top priority. And a week later, the head of the NSA, Admiral Rogers, was quoted as saying the same, that he had not received a directive. So when you've got this different lanes, when you've got a new field, you know, as a former governor, at the end of the day, these, the solution sets are almost always driven by the executive. And what we've lacked has been sustained, constant leadership from this White House on this issue that will, that will continue to plague our country and other countries. So what one of the things we're trying to do we're having election security hearings in, in a bipartisan way with a bipartisan set of recommendations March 21st. We're starting to, to lay out with a, a number of parliamentarians from other Western countries. And there have been evidence, for example, in the recent Catalan vote in Spain. There are evidence of outside interference in the Mexican elections right now. I've, uh, there was a major piece in one of the major newspapers about how the whole Swedish political community from left to right is coming together because they fear intervention for their elections in September. We at least need to bring the parliamentarians together to say this is a tactic of 21st century conflict. And if we can raise that, raise that, and again, in a bipartisan way, hopefully more and more Americans will recognize we've got to get our act together uh, starting with 2018 and much more on a going forward basis. So that all makes, uh, that all makes sense to me on a, on a sort of a macro level, but I'm wondering some of the most imp impactful things that happened during the campaign last year came down to a spear phishing attempt, right? Someone clicked the wrong link in an email and put in their power, a couple people did, uh, someone in the DNC and then John Podesta. Mm -hmm. um, and those are not sort of major sophisticated operations, I mean, they, it comes from a sophisticated source, a Russian fancy bear hacking group, but the spear phishing is not something that is incredibly difficult to pull off or, frankly, incredibly difficult to defend against a lot of times if everyone uses two-factor authentication, if everyone has a YubiKey, so hardware authentication. It, are those standards that are being implemented across uh, sensitive areas of government or the DNC or the RNC? It seems like that's low-hanging fruit um, that does not take sort of a top-down necessarily uh, uh, order from the you know commander in chief. It just seems sort of like a, a practical day-to-day -day solution. Well, again, this is where you, I, I think a year ago people may have put this kind of activity in terms of misinformation, disinformation, use of fake accounts, kind of on the one side of the ledger, and the cyber attacks through spear phishing and other uh, techniques on the other side of the account ledger. Frankly, they're merging all together, and how we make clear to all Americans that we are so vulnerable. Um, we talk about briefly about election systems, but think about our vulnerability. Think about the, the, some of the more recent denial of service attacks, the uh, uh, WannaCry and my, uh, not Petya. You know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of cost. We think back about some of the uh, the cyber attacks recently, not in our country, but say in Ukraine on critical infrastructure, the ability to actually shut down part of a power grid. The number of attacks that are starting to take place in terms of 
uh, financial institutions. Not so much in this country, although there's a lot that's kind of below the radar in this country, but in other countries, much more, much more prominent. This whole notion of how we have to protect ourselves on a, on a cyber basis is something that, again, I don't think we've done a very good job. I'm not a fan of, of the president, but this problem of lack of having a cyber doctrine way precedes this president. Goes back to Obama, goes back to Bush, and uh, that failure to have any doctrine that, and in many ways, our technological advantages in an asymmetrical cyber war warfare means that we have been reluctant to use the cyber tools that we have because of that fear of that escalation. So I would argue, you know, and I'm vice chair of the intelligence committee, um, I got a pretty good idea of what our cyber doctrine activities would be counter to North Korea, counter to Iran, counter to ISIS, but to near peer competitors like China or Russia, I don't think we have a doctrine. I don't think we have a set of rules. And consequently, over the last decade plus, whether this most recent effort from Russia in terms of destabilizing our democracy, or whether it was, you know, cyber theft of intellectual property or defense secrets from China, or the use sometimes, particularly oftentimes in Russia, they will use not actually individuals that are connected with the state security services, but they'll be using individuals that will work for so-called private entities that are owned by Russian oligarchs. You know, we don't have a plan. And the elevation of the need to have kind of basic cyber hygiene on how we all practice, people don't, aren't fully aware of how real this threat is. Uh, I'll give you another just a quick example. Um, and this is where I think we need to all push and you know, it, it, it concerns me that, that it's not higher on, on, on fo folks' focus. Um, you know, right now in America, there's about you know, 10 billion IoT connected devices that we use. As we think about from Alexa to our car to our refrigerator, why exactly we need our toaster connected to the internet, I'm not 100% sure. But you know, we're gonna go from 10 billion to 25 billion devices, IoT connected devices in the next five to six years in America. We have no minimum security standards on any of those IoT devices. They're not patchable. They often have embedded passcodes. There's no kind of good hacker activity to try to pull, point out vulnerabilities. Why would we not put in place at least the power of the government's purchasing power to make sure that we have some de minimis standards in place? You know, think about this for a moment. There was a, a company that's received some notoriety called Kaspersky Labs, Russian-based company that had you know, in many ways proven back doors to Russian government. It took us years to get that software entity off the GSA suggested purchasing list. So the notion of elevating whether it's, you know, the questions around social media, question around election hacking, the question around overall cyber strategy, this has to be a higher priority because I, again, my belief is at least that conflict in the 21st century will be more in this domain than it will be with tanks, guns, planes, and traditional 20th century conflict. Uh, we do want to leave some time for questions, so I'll, make a, a, I'll try to make a segue um, to uh, connected devices that are, uh, which are voting machines in some cases. Not, not, you know, many don't connect to the internet anymore, but uh, as you said, the state of Virginia uh, last fall got rid of all of the uh, touchscreen devices. They had paper backup for all of uh, the things. This seems like a very basic step. This seems like, like two factory seems like a very basic thing. Leave a paper trail so that you can confirm even if something does happen uh, to one of these machines, many of which are vulnerable, you have a trail of that. Uh, but many states are reluctant to do this. Uh, and, I, and I'm just trying to fathom why, and why there isn't a stronger push at the federal level to make this happen. I know that there have been some efforts. I know there's uh, the election security bill that some Democrats introduced once to spend a billion dollars that had no Republican co-sponsors on it. Why? Well, actually, this area, I think there's, there's a couple reasons. One, there's been a historical uh, you know, premise in our country that elections are run by the states and run by localities. In many ways, our decentralized system does make us, does make us stronger against attacks. But if you wanted to affect a national election, you don't need to hack 50 states. You don't need to ha hack two or three states. You need to hack two or three 
counties in a couple of key states and you could swing a presidential election. So I think the, the, there has been, again, this historic resistance from states and localities about federal government intervention. I don't think the federal government wants to intervene. I think we want to try to make sure that we share best practices. I think we want to make sure that we have the appropriate clearances so those practices can be shared in an ongoing way. I do think there needs to be, and this is an area where there is broad bipartisan consensus, and our committee will have a, a set of recommendations, and we go, you know, on our committee there's probably seven um, senators who are actively engaged from both parties and that will come out with specific recommendations this month that then I hope the rest of the Congress will act upon so part of this we can get rid of some of the prohibitions that actually restrict sharing this information and in some cases for a relatively small amount of money to help seed for those states who need to switch out voting machines they allow them to do it because there's really three areas at least in election security that needs to be looked at and, and one the first nobody's really thought that much about but as hard as it is to maybe spread fake news or hack into a government system the most basic area and the ultimate startup as in somebody having been an entrepreneur and run campaigns and been a candidate is a campaign we don't even have good best practices, and this is where I think the DNC and the RNC and others, there needs to be best practices around campaigns, area one. Area two is around voter files. In many ways, the voter files is a totally different set of the election system from voting machines, and oftentimes while there may be a state that says they're going to guard their voter files, how many of those voter files are held in common by the vendor who manages the voter file? And then ultimately the area which has probably received the most attention because there was an effort, kind of a good guy hacker hackathon in Las Vegas last year that showed that many of the voting machines that are still currently in use across the country could be hacked into in about 20 minutes. So the voting machines are the, the final category. So campaigns, voter files, and voting machines. Well, I guess, so you say there are recommendations coming this month, which feels too late to impact 2018 in terms of actually implementing them. But, but I want to go back to, you said it would take a small amount of money probably to fix a lot of these problems. And my question is, 2002, Congress passes the Help America Vote Act, allocates a bunch of money to states to help fix a lot of electoral problems. It's in uh, the wake of uh, you know, Bush Gore. Um, and there's still nearly $400 million sitting from that act that has yet to be allocated by Congress. So why has it taken 16 years, especially now that we have this urgent need, why does it not make sense or you know, why wouldn't Congress allocate that first just to take care of the most pressing needs? Because the states want that. The states don't see that as interference at this point. State secretaries are saying, yes, we'll take that money. And I think that would be a source that a lot of these recommendations would go towards. The challenge, though, and I think a, and the, you know, the, the good news here is I do not believe this question of election security will become, you know, there's not a Democrat versus Republican position. This is still an area where there is broad areas of agreement. But if you step back from that and look at campaign finance and you look at voter registration, unfortunately, there has been a split between the parties over the last decade with one party advocating, Democrats advocating, let's sign more folks up, and unfortunately many states around the country where they've actually had efforts to try to restrict voting or at least you know, dramatically strengthen voter ID and uh, voter ID laws, which have the effect of particularly restricting voting populations. You know, I hope that division, and I, I, I believe we ought to have a country that obviously prospers more with the more people participate that kind of hangover from some of those battles doesn't creep into this area around election security. And that's why it's, you know, it's one of the things on this committee is so important to try to keep this bipartisan because if people end up having, you know, one side believe one set of assumptions, the other side disbelieve, we're in a heap of trouble. Uh, I go back to some of my concerns about the president's failure to acknowledge some of this, some of these threats. That has, I would argue, has has trickled down to some of his supporters, and this gets more into the area we're not touching on today so much in terms of the collaboration, but broad-based ad hominem attacks against the Mueller investigation, or even more frightening in my mind, broad-based attacks, I believe mostly groundless, against the FBI writ large, or for that matter, whole Department of Justice. We saw this week an individual that 
maybe he was a bit of an eccentric individual, that was saying that he was going to decide whether he was going to appear or not before Mueller. Now, he ended up appearing, but when people start questioning the legitimacy of the institutions of our democracy, then our adversaries, Russians or otherwise, have won. And this is, to my mind, it is all interconnected. And again, one of the reasons why trying to keep it at least around the voter security, bipartisan, is critically important. Uh, we've just got a few minutes before um, it's time for audience Q&A, so I do want to ask, uh, you know, you, you've mentioned uh, earlier today that, you know, the U.S. is sort of prepared to fight a 20th century war, um, and, and the idea of looking to the past and sort of playing catch-up is interesting to me in that, you know, we're, we're still sort of in the process of getting, taking stock of what Russia did across social media, uh, mm -hmm. uh, across voting machines. Um, are we now so focused on that that we might be blinkered to whatever is coming next? Because this is not, it is an ongoing campaign and it, it would, I think, be narrow-minded to think that this is the only aspect of it and that it won't evolve as well. A absolutely. You know, it, we're still trying to struggle with how we identify the sourcing of fake accounts. What happened when we have what's called the deep fakes, deep fake technology, where we can put your face on my body, or even worse for you, vice versa. Be and an then, honor. you know, what happens? You can actually, what, what it's been, and not just being able to place somebody's face on somebody else's body, but anybody that's been in public life, I've heard at least that if you have more than 40 hours of kind of recorded video of you, that virtually with my body and my image, you can have any words come out of my mouth, regardless of whether I said them in that sequence. If we have people not knowing what to believe or not in terms of what happened in 2016 when it was just accounts, what happens when you actually have your political leadership saying and doing things you know, on the eve of, a, of an election that have no reality based? So yes, we are, I think, behind, behind the eight ball. And um, it's, I would go back again to kind of misinformation, disinformation, but it fits into a broader context of how we prepare ourselves to fight in this realm of misinformation, disinformation, and cyber. How do you, though, how do you proactively combat something like that? Because you can't, you can't sort of slow the pace of innovation there. You can't sort of slow the research, and, and the research is being done often in good faith. You know, knowing that it is a problem upcoming and actually actively working to uh, uh, stem uh, the, the, the potential impact seem like two different things. So is there, you know... Well, I think it, at some level, you know, you're going to have to look at least in terms of the, the, uh, the platform companies, whether, they can, whether the, the foundation they based on that they had no responsibility at all for the content that passed over their, their platforms, I think has to be re-examined. And I would again urge the companies to work with us because if Washington legislates this top down without their input, we probably won't get it right. I think as well that we're going to have to, you know, open up questions such as, do we say this more gets into the cyberspace? Do we use the analogy to what kind of it seemed like most of the civilized world came around to in terms of landmines, that there may be certain weapons that we just will agree we won't use? And will there be even nations, you know, we start with the West, but then even nations like Russia and China that would agree to some of those parameters? Do we need to have a debate about you know, again, this would be heresy at most South Bys, but the question of liability around the software world. You know, what's the standard of due care? It's so extraordinarily complicated. But I got to tell you, when I got 145 million Americans who had no direct customer relationship with Equifax, and Equifax didn't take advantage of the patch and then didn't have the good sense to even when they did find this out, inform the public, there should be penalty. I would argue, should we make sure that we get these lines of authority between all the government agencies that are handling this realigned? Absolutely. Should we make sure that when we're purchasing government, purchasing IoT devices, we have basic security? I think it makes common sense. And maybe we ought to sense that that $700 billion we're spending on national security, some of that ought to be reallocated towards cybersecurity, and frankly, some of that ought to be reallocated towards where the next level of conflict or, frankly, prosperity will come around, you know, artificial intelligence, around quantum computing, around, you know, next generation machine learning, so that we have the same kind of technological advantage uh, 
that we maintain now. Because if we don't, I can assure you that China has a plan in these areas. And they are executing on their plan. And we fail to do so at our peril. The notion, and we live in the greatest country in the world, but the notion that that was predestined for all time is not set in stone unless we act. And this ought to be something that we can, again, rally, regardless of whether you, you know, lean left or lean right. This is less about Republican, Democrat, or liberal, conservative, and it's much more in the context of future past. And we've got to have policymakers that will work with you guys on trying to get it right on a future basis. Uh, I, and in terms of you have a hearing on Tuesday, I think, a confirmation hearing for Lieutenant General Paul Nakasone, is that right? For, uh, to take over as uh, NSA head, right? Uh, NSA and for the time being Cybercom, where and so, <laughs> in how we divide, <laughs> multi we chop up these things into. Uh, what do you want to hear from him, or what do you what do you what is the bar for you when you talk to him in terms of how he is going to face these threats that is different from the way it's being approached now? Because clearly, you're not satisfied with the way that the U.S. has taken on this challenge. So, what does he need to demonstrate to you, or, or in terms well, of the NSA's path? Let me be clear. I mean, part. Of, my frustration with, with some of how our intelligence community has reacted is, right, frankly, not that much with the individuals in charge. If Admiral Rogers from the NSA was sitting here today, he would say these exact same things in certain areas even stronger. So part of this comes back to you, our responsibility in the Congress to make sure that we get these you know, lanes and responsibilities right. Part of this comes with a willingness to have the technology community who has been reluctant, to say the least, to engage on a lot of these issues, to realize if you don't engage, the American public is going to demand that we act, and acting without collaboration may not be a very good solution set. Uh, and you, I want to hear from him, and I, I believe I will, that he, one, recognizes the threat, two, is committed to working with the American kind of, this needs to be more than whole of government, needs to be whole of society, writ large, to try to work through these solutions. I want to hear that he's going to be committed to having a cyber doctrine that we can articulate. Policymakers like me, and frankly, you should know what our kind of, what our array of responses would be, particularly when we have a near-peer adversary like a Russia or China use cyber tools against us. We don't have that clarity at this point. And it's time that we do. All right, and now I think we're going to open up the floor to questions. If you, anyone has any, you can line up behind that microphone there in a nice orderly fashion. Oh, man, good seat. That's why I was there. Um, thanks, Mark, for, for being open here. Um, I'm curious when it comes to the responsibility of the U.S. in terms of protecting companies, because we know many Russian groups used tools that the NSA created in order to hack many things this year. Um, and so I'm curious on your view on whether the NSA should be creating and hoarding these tools or whether it should be going to these companies and saying, we have found these vulnerabilities uh, sorry, and that you should that fix them. Again? Sorry, say again. I, I missed your last part. So I'm saying, should the NSA be creating and hoarding threats, like zero-day attacks, or should they be proactively going to these American companies and offering this as information in the same way that a responsible hacker might? Great question. Um, short answer is yes, but most of that responsibility doesn't fall to the NSA because the NSA's job is to not deal with American content. That falls to the job of the Department of Homeland Security. Now, is that the right split? That might be a fair question since the NSA has you know, more, more tools in their tools kit. Um, so there's alignment issues, and, but, but your other question, one of the things that I think that you know, the United, that would help would be quicker attribution. You think back, we have not used that very much. I mean, one of the few times that we've, you know, the government has used attribution in a major way was after the Sony hack, and we attributed it to North, North Korea and took actions. But, as you kind of indirectly raise, particularly when we're getting to near-peer 
adversaries, and I do think President Obama sent the message to President Xi in the last couple of years of his administration, and the amount of cy Chinese cyber espionage dramatically went down. But if you do start calling out and naming, it will go both ways. So it's a valid, it's a valid point. Yes, sir. Senator Warner, thank you for coming out today. Appreciate your time and also your service. I'm a, uh, I like to call myself a rhino expat, <laughs> and I am extremely disturbed by this issue. You know, I think it's very disingenuous for Facebook or Twitter to claim they cannot control content when they do such a good job controlling uh, child pornography, certain other things. And there are extraordinary economic profits that come from their first moving network effect. They're basically a natural monopoly, not through any uh, deceit or crime, it's just a network effect. But certainly they have the profits to somewhat end the social responsibility that comes with being what's well, almost a utility in, in act, if not if in, law, in law. Do you feel that severe financial penalties for failure to adequately police what is on your platform is appropriate in an environment where you already have a utility status in society? Well, you, you got a lot in that question. <laughs> yeah, let me... I think we need a full debate about responsibility on content. And part of this debate will come up shortly, at least in the Senate, where there is, again, broad-based bipartisan support to at least make sex trafficking you know, that you didn't get the exemption, what's called Section 230, that exempts them from responsibility on content. If you start with sex trafficking, you know, it, will, it possibly could move to other areas. Um, because, you know, if you think back historically, you know, the auto industry, I didn't realize until, because I've been learning up, you know, the auto industry for the first 30, 40 odd years of its existence had no liability. But then at some point it got to have, you know, enough stability that they put liability in place. I think some of that Analogy can be made to social media. I think it can be made as well to um, um, questions around, around software. Uh, I want to do it in a way, though, that doesn't destroy innovation and, ch and move all the innovation abroad, because if we simply deal with this on an American company-only basis, there are 20-plus Chinese tech companies, all with valuations of north of $20 billion each. You know, we may have heard of Huawei and... Alibaba and Badu and Tencent, but there's a dozen more that most Americans, maybe this crowd, most Americans wouldn't know about, and you don't want to simply replace the current you know, purveyors with foreign companies that could, that could come to our source. And again, we're not ready for that. Uh, I do think there is, there is a, a different kind of technique. Um, you know, there, there's some folks who've made presentations to me that say, you know, Facebook and, and Google, Twitter, their algorithms try to have us look at our phones 150 times a day and want our kids to look at them 250 to 300 times a day. My kids, I think, have already hit that number. And it really is a different business proposition. If you think of information, every time we touch our phone, we're giving them an effect of information as oil, the new oil of the 21st century. And that, you know, I don't have it fully figured out, but it is a, it's a different kind of business proposition that, frankly, then precludes new entrants to the market that's a different way than it was in a normal product or even traditional software firm. Thank you. I'm going to have to give shorter answers or you know, we'll be here all evening. I hope this one's very short. Okay. Um, so, Senator Warren, you mentioned that you feel like the executive branch has to drive our cybersecurity posturing when it comes to improving our cybersecurity posture nationally. However, Mr. Barrett asked you about the low-hanging fruit uh, within improving your own individual security posture. He mentioned that the major breach did not come from sophisticated attacks. It was actually a low cost, low effort, low sophistication attack driven by a nation state. So it was not how they got in, it was what they did with it. I feel like you didn't fully answer the question to my satisfaction. I apologize for saying that, but I feel like um, you didn't quite answer the question when he asked you, what are you doing? You don't need, he pointed out, you don't need permission from the executive branch to improve your individual posturing or within your Senate office or within well, the I, I can tell you, everyone in my operation has dual authentication, has 
better practicing cyber hygiene. My cyber hy hygiene is a heck of a lot better than it was two years ago as well. Um, and you, there are things short of the executive acting. I got a bipartisan piece of legislation that should be, this is one of my frustrations in the job sometimes, this should be a no-brainer that says the United States government, in terms of purchasing devices, shouldn't purchase any IoT-connected devices that don't have basic security built in, that aren't patchable, that don't have, that, that, you know, don't have embedded passcodes, that have some list of vulnerabilities. Um, we're going to have a set of recommendations on election security that I hope to push that becomes law. I think my, absolutely, my responsibility is to push this from a legislative standpoint, but because, as, as Brian has indicated, the clock is ticking in 2018, mm -hmm. and this is a newsflash. Congress these days is not new, known for its speed and agility. Um, you know, as a former chief executive, as a governor, to get some of this done in a timely way, yes, it requires Congress, but more immediately, it requires the executive. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. I have to admit, when I walked into this room, my heart sank, not because of who's on the stage, but because of who's not in the seats behind us. You know, we're facing one of the most critical issues to our democracy today. And in a place like Austin, in a place like South by Southwest, why there's not more people standing in line, I don't get it. So the question that I have for you, Let me tell you both as bummed as you were, take that times 10 in terms of what I thought would I, be here. I believe it. You're a politician, but you're also a statesman. Here you are, vice chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. So my question for you is about not what's happening in Congress, but about American voter apathy, about losing track of the most precious thing, which is our democracy. What do you have to say about that? And if, you know, if it's not going to come from the top, where is it going to come from? It has to come from somewhere. Well, here's one, and, you know, and, and the size of the crowd does, is, is discouraging. Because I think people want to, and I get it, you know, the news comes on, back and forth, they want to throw a shoe at the TV. I feel the same way and I'm inside the TV. <laughs> but I don't think we can do that because if we, if we opt out, we turn the keys over to the extremes on either end. And that's generally not where, I would argue at least, where good policy has been made historically in our country. So I would argue that we need, you know, again, regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum, to be willing to stand up for our institutions. And we all need to have our voices heard. You know, I tried to do a, got a lot of attention right before the holidays um, about trying to put a marker down to say that if the president got rid of Mueller, that would be a constitutional crisis. I believe that. And I think we need to rally again people of both parties to, uh, to that cause, in, not in support of a particular investigation, but in, turn, in, in the course of trying to search for the truth and, frankly, to defend institutions. If there, was a, if there was a separate session, I would even argue that part of the problem right now is that both of our political parties are, frankly, too backwards looking to the 20th century. But just, just a follow-up. I'm not talking about the parties. I'm talking about the American people. I'm talking about apathy, the democracy. The, it's the people. What? I mean, if you guys can't do it, it's the people that ultimately have to do it. So what's going to rally the people? People should be standing at the streets right now because we're under assault. I don't get it. Well, there that's are, my question. Let me, there are days I scratch my head as well. But I do, I can tell you, out around my state, for that matter, around the country, I don't, I don't think, I think there's more activism than I've seen in the recent past. Because there is frustration with some of the political direction. But I think we're going to be in a time, I would argue, how this, our, my committee's investigation follows out, how the Mueller investigation follows out, you know, we could have critical moments in our country's history this year. And where Americans stand, and if they're willing to stand up and be counted, is going to be the test of whether we continue to be the, the preeminent country that we have been for most of our history. Then I'm, yeah. I'm told we have just a couple minutes left, so I think maybe a couple more questions. Okay, this one is very quick. Uh, I'm Brazilian. We are facing a very polarized election this year, so I came to learn 
with your mistakes uh, about <laughs> what we could do. Uh, Where are you, you from again? I'm sorry, you said? Brazil. Brazil. From Brazil, okay. Yeah. You will remember. Uh, you say that Russia tactics are to use misinformation and disinformation to mess with another country's stability, right? Uh, back in 2016, we were talking in Brazil about proofs that U.S. intelligence were constantly accessing Brazilian's president email. So, on your discourse, you are using examples such as Dutch and French election and Brexit as in implying that we are in the same side, okay? We are the good ones against the Russians. Uh, then you were talking about how America needs to understand the importance to invest and focus on cyber defense. Are you saying, so that I understand, that these tactics that Russia uses are unfair, undemocratic, and should not be used? Are you saying that America won't interfere in another country's election? I'm saying that America... What I am asking is, I am here to understand how we can defend ourselves of attacks. Are you saying that when you are planning our, uh, your strategy, you are only thinking about defense and that you are saying that these tactics are unfair, undemocratic, and should not be used by an honest and good country? Let me first of all say that America does not have a totally clean record of not interfering in other countries' elections. Yeah. But I think there is a real difference between American democracy, or for that matter, European democracy, or for that matter, with all the challenges you've got in Brazil, with Brazilian democracy, and what passes for an election, what will pass for an election in Russia this month. And I think there has been a willingness to use tools and suppress dissent, whether in Russia or, for that matter, you know, in China. Some of these same companies that we've talked about, not the American ones so much now as the Chinese companies, but there is a whole different relationship between the government and society in terms of willingness to have censorship or surveillance. The whole notion of some of these newer apps that could be basically measuring, because they know everything you're doing, your social credit. How good a citizen are you? I think those are things that, I've been to your country a number of times, you know, I don't think Brazilians would ever put up with. No. I don't think Americans would ever put up with. So while we have differences, I think in this arena, in terms of you know, trying to search out the truth and trying to make sure that people do not manipulate information or put a fake person's face on my body, and uh, I think there is a commonality. And I think those are tools that should not be used. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And then everyone, I'm sorry, I'm told that we're out of time. I'm sorry for the people who are still I'll be happy to try to visit briefly with everyone. I, last point, Brian, thank you, but please. Earlier gentleman's comment about why isn't this room bursting at the seams? But don't give up faith. You know, uh, it's always been a bad bet to bet against, you know, our country getting it right. But this is, I believe, one of those moments. And it's a different kind of, th of threat than we've seen historically where a country appears and it feels like it's, you know, a physical invasion with weaponry of, of the past. But the threat is every much as real in many ways more imminent and all of our advantages of the past in terms of wealth and technology are in effect almost used asymmetrically against us in this. So my thanks. And, and thank you, Senator Warner, and thank you all for coming. Um